session. I'm ready. Okay. Welcome to Alex and DJ Watch Your Dark. I'm DJ. I'm Alex. Thanks for joining us. This week we're watching Hearts of Darkness, a yeah. documentary about the making of the seminal Francis Ford Coppola movie, Apocalypse Now. A filmmaker's apocalypse, I believe, is the subtitle to that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, which is like really almost a pretentious title. Um, yeah, but you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing about the anything that happens after the colon. You can always like kind of at the last minute just drop it. If you feel like you're around people who might consider you pretentious, you don't have to say the second part. That's true. Well, didn't he say something about not wanting to be pretentious? In That's it? exactly what it was. That was like one of the greatest crimes was when you're reaching for something great and then you end up just being bloated and pretentious. That's right. And that's cool that he was aware of that because Apocalypse Now could have easily been a, a bloated, pretentious yeah. movie. I, maybe there's some people who might think that it is on some level as well. I mean, at least with certain things, there are people that, you know, it was not without its critics. True. And it also starred a bloated and pretentious Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> full circle. Can I say he something He was actually the size of a full circle. Anyway, sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> his head, his body. <laughs> yeah. It was like when you learn to animate. Let's not just... say anything about his head. I think it was he had fine fashion. Do you have any idea how nice it is to, by the way, rinse your, your full head with water? When I saw him doing that, I was like, I get it. I get does it. Does it feel good? I get it, Marley. You know, uh, I've shaved my head, and that does feel good, the coolness of the water against your bare head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. true. It's tr I'm saying it's it's just, there's nothing like it. It's you get a, You get to have a shampoo shower anytime you're at a sink. Mm. Yeah, I'm really trying. I'm really, really trying to uh, embrace as much of this culture as possible. Well, it looks great on you, thanks. and I'm not just saying that. It really suits you. Oh, thanks. Let me say something before we move on. We talked about this, uh, you know, in private, so I know you want to talk about it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Hearts of Darkness, last week McAfee felt a little icky when that episode ended. We had a good time. Oh yeah, we went to a dark place. Yeah, that was kind of. Yeah, I felt uh, there was. Uh, I felt very unclean Residue. at the end of that. Yeah, we, we were sort of riffing a little much, and um, yeah, we may have uh, hit a couple of targets that were off the mark. I don't even know if it's targets. I know you're a good guy. You know I'm a good guy. The one thing I would be worried about is that people didn't know we were empathetic towards the, the Belizean girls yeah, who, yeah, yeah. who he was doing these sexual acts Oh, with. no, no, no. There's no doubt that, I guess, I guess, I guess uh, yes. I mean, I guess that wasn't as implicit in the fact that um, uh, yeah, I mean, he is a complete creep, and he basically was a creep. He crept on that whole scene and and took advantage of everybody in in different ways. And yes, he's like, he is he is he was pure darkness, and these poor girls were at kind of his whim. And that uh, yeah, to say that that's not a a very bad thing. Do you know what got me a little bit is the casual way that the girls reflected on it. So I think that's why I didn't treat it with the seriousness because right. the way they were like, yeah, he wanted me to shit. And, and you were like, oh, they seem cool. I think cool. it's true. I think it's almost like that section came off almost as a little uh, comedy relief within the film. Mm -hmm. Like there was kind of like, you know, because I think if it was treated differently, maybe I would have treated it differently too. Yeah. But you know what? That is no excuse for me not taking responsibility <laughs> for not taking something uh, seriously and not uh, and by the way while I'm doing this I'm even mockingly doing it yeah. so, uh, there's no there's no way out I can't stop myself that's true we're comedians come on but for as God long as the people sakes. know that we have empathy we're for also them. human beings that's right comedians yeah. first so. I, I can speak for myself only <laughs> okay moving on yes. McAfee was a creep uh, yes. much empathy for everybody involved sociopath in uh, a terror exactly. a, uh, a narcissist I was strangely such such. drawn to him the point is <laughs> <laughs> Just because I see a bit of a reflection doesn't mean it's necessarily the exact image. <laughs> Moving on to this week, the yes. the, the hearts of <clears throat> the hearts of dark. <laughs> you can barely get it out. Yes. So this, this is a much lighter fare. It's just about this filmmaking. This happened to me though when I when I been doing like motivational speaking or anything whenever a part of my speech comes where I'm supposed to like say something heartfelt I literally choke on my words when I'm supposed to be earnest because I'm so used to being a comedian oh. that I struggle when things get real oh yeah. it's a choke it's a choke it's not a laugh you're saying it's a choke I was almost choking on my words like I feel yeah. like it's it's like a uh, the comedian in me is trying to stifle oh, the like human in me that's what it is it's trying it's trying to break free it's like Mr. Hyde is trying to bust out <laughs> yeah you get down there <laughs> we got jokes to tell <laughs> exactly what the hell are you on this earth for if not for this? So yeah. Hearts of Darkness was Coppola. It was what he was put on this earth to do, that, if we may segue in. Yeah, yeah, seg, seg your way right in there. Hey, what, a, what a trip that movie was. I mean, he said he wanted to recreate the war with the documentary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, watching it, 
I watched Apocalypse Now before I watched the documentary. I rewatched Apocalypse Now, and you did too. Yes. And the interesting thing is, I watched the original version. You watched the like Redux that they just came out with. Well, yeah, right? it's actually yeah. The Redux actually was the really long one in two thousand or two thousand one, and then this one came out like in 2017, 2019, I can't remember. But it but it's uh, the final cut, so it's like twenty minutes less than the really long one. But it's probably I don't know maybe twenty minutes more than the than this 1979 original, which you watched. Yeah. Right? So there were scenes in mind that you didn't see, and we can get to that. Well, but I wanted to say, can I actually just say one thing about yeah. the watching of it? Is I watched it uh, in my apartment uh, where, uh, as as the helicopter is coming up. You At know, the very beginning? At the beginning, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, wouldn't you know, but some LAPD helicopter also circling my area, as it does very frequently, we live in a very yeah. similar neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so not only similar neighborhood, the exact same neighborhood, <laughs> same same <laughs> neighborhood, Hollywood Village. Yeah. Um, but but it's uh, shout out. But um, it it was uh, it was circling at the same time. It was it was literally. And by the way, this uh, w was known for its surround sound. It was it was actually uh, recorded in like five point one, and they restored it, and that's what I saw. Mm. So I was getting like my background, my my back. What do they call them? The speakers, the backup speakers. I don't know. Yeah, the, the surround sound behind you. Yeah, it's just like a simple name, and I feel like uh. an idiot. What do you call them? Like a grandpa, the backup speakers. You know, like you have them in the back of your van. Anyway, the, the, um, it felt like that was like the point one. I had the five, and then that was the mm. point one. Wow. By the way, I'm pointing off screen like this, so ridiculous if you're watching at home. Yeah, you, that's where the helicopters generally are, just up there <laughs> they somewhere. They were behind me. And, uh, I wish I would have watched the one you watched, because the original was amazing. Actually, maybe this is good, because we can compare and contrast, but the sound, I would have loved to hear yeah. those helicopters and war. Yeah. And, um, but the one thing I, I forgot is I wanted to start this episode the way that Francis Ford Coppola starts all of his uh, shoots. He I wrote, gathers the, I wrote the, the name. What was the word? <laughs> gathers them all around. I'll hold my hand, Alex. It's a little tight. It's a little far. We're, wow. Puwaba. Puwaba. That's what Puwaba. it was. Puwaba. 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 Puwaba was the third one. Yeah. That yeah. felt good, I think. I, I guess. I mean, we were kind of know. joined at the fingertips. It <laughs> yeah. was very, one of the most unusual ways in which I've held a man. <laughs> Wish I could say the same. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a 238-day principal photography production. So principal means there might have been they might have been shooting some B-roll stuff after that. That's I right. Guess. Yeah. The but 238 days in the Philippines. Yeah. And he said, this isn't a movie about the war. This is the war. Yeah, that's Which right. Which is a bit, I mean, soldiers right. who were actually in the war might go eh, easy, but. Yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, you were worried that it would uh, you'd fuck with your insurance if somebody died. Yeah. A different kind of risk. Yeah. Yeah, he was a bit, uh, talk about, you know, I don't want to be pretentious, but this is Vietnam. I mean, what an yeah. asshole. In the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he, but I mean. I guess that's the attitude you want the filmmaker to have because he, damn, did he come close to what recreating what I imagine Vietnam would have been like. Right. And you, and you, you have no idea. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I was also going to say my idea of Vietnam probably stems in part largely due to films like other, Apocalypse other, Now. Other movies. Yeah. Or even Apocalypse Now because even movies that have come about Vietnam since then yes. have probably boiled heavily from. Uh, Apocalypse Now because it was one of the first films to really shine a, a real truthful yeah. light on uh, yeah I think I almost feel like it's the it's the raw uh, there's a rawness to it. There's, it, it it feels more shocking than some although something like Deer Hunter was like a pretty have you ever seen that movie I haven't seen it yeah, I gotta so, see that so that's also like kind of there's a, some intensity to that too that's that can be troubling I think there there it was already around that time that uh, tone that you'd get from a movie like that, where it, where there's a uh, intensity and a uh, that you kind of feel the, uh, the 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 frightening thrill of the moment. Yeah, you know, and and also like the uh, the vagaries where it's not all like jingoistic. It's like, what are we doing here? Is this? Right. I can't speak for Deer Hunter, but Apocalypse Now wasn't like. America, rah, rah. It was like America, but also yeah. what the hell's going on? Well, it's weird that it's like kind of. It, on some level, you think that it's going to be anti-war, but it's. I think that's what, that was part of uh, what he was saying. Is it, it's not. It's not anti. It just is. It, it is. is. And so people take away what they want from it, which it, which was what Martin Sheen threw out there. Did you hear that? What he was talking about? Um, he actually. I saw an interview where he actually said 
people came up to him. Uh, half the people would say that movie uh, stopped me from going into the military, and the other half say that that movie inspired me to go into the military. Wow. So so it really is that thing where it's like thrilling, but it depends on whether morally you it, you, uh, you feel it or whether um, uh, as a warrior you feel it. You can, yeah. It's an inter- it's really interesting. Maybe that's that's part of what makes it art is that it's is that it's not you really can't nail it down in that way. Yeah, you what you said nails it. He just presented it as is and then it's up to the consumer or the patron to be like what does this mean to me? Totally. That's beautiful. Not yeah. like this is a message. Yes. You know, those things don't they don't stand the test of time I as well. I guess that's what it is, isn't it? The more anything that that even has a little sniff of moralistic uh, element, which I that's why you know I wanted to make sure we didn't feel that in the beginning of this episode as we apologized for the <laughs> previous <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> morals are different from uh, empathy. I think. That's right. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. They're I've, they're interconnected. I studied both those words, but but they haven't fully assimilated with my <laughs> worldview. You know, Martin Short uh, spoke. I used to work for this charity that's called Free the Children. That's now uh, disgraced. I felt they were pretty disgraced when I worked there already, <laughs> but now I, they're pretty much officially disgraced yes. in the opinion of the Canadian public. But uh, they used to have big celebrities come speak at an event called We Day. And they would have, I mean, the Dalai Lama came, um, I mean, Trudeau came all the time, the Prime Minister of sure. Canada, before he was Prime Minister even. Um, the biggest star, Bieber came, sure. name a star, they were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Cher. Mar- uh, Cher was not there. You named the one star who was <laughs> there. I'm sorry, but when I'm asking a question, I have to answer it always. <laughs> But Martin Sheen came by one year and he did this like pre thing where there were it wasn't a packed stadium. It was like 5000 people, kids, high school students Mm -hmm. watching. And uh, he was describing his experience on Apocalypse Now. But the thing you got to understand about We Day is it's pretty like uh, Uh it's for kids, right? So it's like we're going to give you the basics. Like there's people in this world who don't have water. We need to help them. Martin Sheen is detailing how he had done too many drugs. (laughs) Uh, how how wait a second so very quickly how old range age range are the kids in here? Well, the easiest ones to con into the scam that Free the Children was running are between like twelve and sixteen. Okay, I just want yeah. so he's trying. It to wasn't make a it complete scam. I'm being facetious. They did some good stuff, but you know, right? Uh, <laughs> they did some stuff I didn't agree with too. Uh, okay. But Martin Sheen was talking about how like yeah, I had a heart attack probably from all the drugs I was doing. He's trying uh, to make it a don't do drugs uh, speech. Yeah, but then it was like really real. He was like I was crawling out to the road and uh, I had to eat grass to remind myself that I was alive just shoving handfuls of grass in my mouth. Sounds like and you're just looking at all these kids they're like this story's pretty real. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sounds like a bad trip. Yeah. Marty. I mean it pretty it pretty much was. It was a heart attack, but it was a he was doing so many well he was drinking a lot and doing so many those guys all were all of them that's another thing about this movie the expression the fog of war right yeah, that yeah. it was the fog of war yeah. and the fog of drugs like the whole time I watched it I might have smoked a joint before I watched the movie so I was in my own I fog. was clear headed <laughs> okay did you feel any fogginess without having no, any right now I'm feeling a little foggy but no <laughs> uh, it was it was yeah I mean there was actually there was literal fog right he wanted that he wanted the, he used fog a lot because he wanted it to, um Oh, that he used that actually during the French uh, scene that, that you didn't see. I didn't see. He used that a lot because he wanted it to seem like they were ghosts of the past and they were going to be gone because they were the French colonialists that were there originally and they were still going to hold their ground. That that whole thing, you they didn't show that, but that's that, that's in the, that's in the doc. That scene looked so good in the documentary that I was sad that it wasn't in the movie. When you watched it, did did it feel like it needed to be in there, or, or were you like I could have done without that scene? Um, I. I kind of liked it. It kind of, it just broke it up because I feel like this was so much, it's just, it's an odyssey, right? Um, And I think he called it, was it him that called it? Idiodyssey? Idiodyssey, yeah. Yeah. Good word. That was a funny one. Yeah. Um, So funny, look at me, I'm cracking up. But uh, (laughs) but it was pretty good. Um, But it's more of an odyssey when you actually have these stops into different spots, you know, where they where they had the you know, that's the thing is that is the Playboy bunnies were supposed to represent the sirens. Mm -hmm. And then they stopped off um, at the um, at this French plantation to kind of give you a sense of the past. Like they were actually apparently the whole thing was he was moving backwards through the past. So now it's the 50s and now we're going back then and then they eventually went to like kind of primeval times. Yeah. Which, by the way, I got to step in with this. Because I found out these things where apparently some people have an issue with the um, there's a there's a I guess a negative racial bent to this in the sense that 
those um, uh, those those uh, those tribes, which what was it Montane Montane? What did they call it? Oh them? yeah, it was something. It was like a French Montane. Yeah, 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 yeah. That tribe. Um, I mean, I mean, it didn't really exist at that time at that in that way. It was sort of like uh, they were trying to make it just they were trying to parallel to the original source material of Heart of Darkness mm. with that tribe. So they were kind of like inserted these guys that are in the in the jungle in Vietnam, but they didn't actually they weren't really there. Mm. That's the gist I got. So, I mean, it's a bit of a fantasy type of story as well. I mean, it was very fant there's fantasy elements to it. Yeah. There was a, a cut scene that I'm curious if it was in the version you watched because I watched an interview with Robert Duvall today and he was talking about how there was a scene where he his character, Kilgore, one of the all-time great characters, man. What a treat to watch him play Kilgore. But he said there's a scene where he saves a baby and he was adamant that they should keep it in and Coppola ended up cutting it out. Was no. it in the version you watched? Did he no. save a baby? No, just a puppy. No, but he That's didn't it. save that, right? Lance saved the That's puppy, right. the surfer right. dude. Yeah. Are you saying Kilgore will save the baby? Mm. Oh wait, actually, you know what? I think Remember when he's did. Th I think this he is did, in the actually. original. I think he did. Oh really? Yeah. Remember when he's saving the guy and he's like, Give him water he, and and he he you actually see a moment of empathy and That's compassion right. from him. That's right. But then the surfer's over there, he's like, Lance the surfer and he just throws the canteen on the That's guy's right. body and That's walks over. That's exactly it. And, you know, I was watching an, an interview with Martin Sheen, and he was talking about how amazing Robert Duvall was. Every scene they rehearsed, the helicopters weren't going crazy behind them or the bombs because they had limited resources in that department. So he would do the whole scene quiet, and then the scene would start. And, you know, the whole point of Kilgore's character is he's completely unfazed by the chaos happening uh, around. It's wonderful. And he said Duvall didn't need more than one take ever. Like, the helicopters would be, like, going right behind them, bombed, and he would just not flinch, not stop a line. Like... He was actually you, fearless. You could feel that though in that in he has such he had such strength and you know, strength of the grin too. He had like such a uh, he was such a, a, a he was a magnificent bastard. I guess someone might call him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was he he had that already. So I mean, he knew obviously he can summon it up to the extent where he could totally sh he could play fully inhabit that type of character and just just shut out everything around him. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was so good. He was just. Yeah, he was he was magnetic. And you know what's crazy? They surfed in that area of the Philippines because they shot in the Philippines and not Vietnam. Yeah. That area is a surfing haven in Filipino. A whole gen or in the Philippines, a whole generation of Filipinos have come up surfing. There's surf shops there now. It's a resort town really? where they filmed that exact scene. I forget the name of the town, Haver. Or do the, not that do the wave? Does the wave break? Does it break the way that? I don't know two if it waves? breaks as perfectly as he described, but it is good surfing conditions. Look at that. Huh? And and there's um. Uh, there's a line that he says where he's like, "What do you they know? Charlie don't surf." You know, Charlie was That's a derogatory right. term based for the on Viet Cong. Isn't it? I don't know, but there's a surf shop in in that town now called Charlie Does. Of, uh, not Charlie Does Surf, just Charlie Does. Charlie Does. Charlie Does. That's Ooh. what it says on the sign. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like the I like the confidence. Yeah, Charlie you know? Does. Yeah, and just watch Charlie. <laughs> Watch Charlie surf. By the way, is this a problem? Me saying Charlie like this? I think so. I think it's really. But is it a problem, problem for the Filipino to call Vietnamese like to make to put Charlie right on your side? Yeah, it's true too, isn't it? Yeah. I guess they feel like they're above, you know. It's like ah, we're all Charlies out here. The way from you know, I'm saying from I'm saying from the point of view of Americans, white Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying from the point of view of the bad guy. I like you. By I don't the way. feel that I like you giving me the eyes. So I got to suddenly I'm like back on back pedal, back pedal. Oh, I'm You're win on gold. thin ice after the McAfee back episode, pedal. bud. I'm gonna win gold. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way that normally I'd be yelling that at the top of my lungs, but you know people could be sleeping. <laughs> You're right. We are in a living room. That's Let's true. not lie. That's Let's true. not beat around the bush. Yeah. Uh, and also it should be noted that all of our technological devices were giving us so much problems before we started this episode. Oh my God, we so this isn't an ep, you know, this isn't an, a podcast about a movie about the Vietnam War. This is this the is Vietnam War? <laughs> You're saying this is <laughs> the Vietnam War? I'm saying War? it. No, I said it. I, I stole the line. <laughs> but, but I will tell you that after like how many times things wouldn't connect and Wi-Fi's weren't responding, uh, with each moment, my heart was growing darker. <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> yeah, you, could you see. became Colonel Kurtz yeah. in front of me. I didn't Three know what shades you were capable too of. dark is what I felt. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say too the one thing I liked about the documentary and. I, 
I'm sure it was an intentional decision. Of course it was. The allusion to Marlon Brando at the beginning, but never really showing him, and then him coming in at the end the same way Colonel Kurtz does in the movie. That's right, Marlon man. Brando was the Colonel Kurtz of the documentary. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. you know what? When you got Marlon, you really got to take advantage of him and really make it an appearance. Yeah, make get more out of his $3 million, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's in his right. contract, it, it right. said we can use this for a documentary later, too. Did it actually? I, I'm say making that. That, out, that was good though. You, you said know? it with confidence. Yeah, but uh, you're like Kilgore. And then also Harvey Keitel being originally cast. That's right. I went down a bit of a hole with that. They wanted mm. Steve McQueen. I know. I went down the same hole. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because then you see the movie and you can't picture it being anyone other than Martin Sheen, because I think he's great in it. Yeah, yeah. But then when you think about the list they go through, they it's start like, with Steve McQueen. He was like, I know it's not going to be uh, just 16 weeks. Right. It's going to be longer. And he had a he, he had kids going to high school yeah. and new young ones. I forget. Right. And he was also only four years away from passing away from cancer. I think he already had cancer at the right. time. So, so you he want to enjoy his last years without yeah. being stuck in it, by the way. And it did seem like such a drag to be there for that long. Yeah. <sighs> what a job. Well, yes, but I also, um, let me, let me go through the actors sure, again and I'm going to come sure, back to that, sure. but I really want to get into the, the drag slash fun that I think it would have been. Yeah. Steve McQueen says no. James Caan says no. Al Pacino says no. Jack Nicholson says no. Harvey Keitel says yes. They go with him. They shoot for a month with him. They go, that's not right. They cut him loose, mm -hmm. bring in Martin Sheen. And to be a month in and to cut loose your lead actor, like the balls on Coppola, man. Sure. But it was sure. his money. It's that's another money. thing. It was his, his money. His money and his vision. I mean, it was just, that's the thing. He's looking at it and he goes like, no, nah, that's not what I see. What was it? It was something about him being too outwardly in his performance. Like he was kind of twitchy and, and, and. It He's Harvey Keitel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't like internalizing it as much, I guess, as, as, as Martin Sheen would. And yeah. Martin Sheen, apparently he was, uh, that whole, fr um, uh, bathroom, you know, sorry, the broken mirror scene. Well, you know uh, that whole uh, thing. He was he he just described himself as being in a really low place in his life, and mm -hmm. that all of the all of that came out in that scene. He kind of like just just let it all pour out. And so I remember one of the lines he said was, "My heart is broken." I know. And he's just and he's just bawling and aching. And apparently he was just letting it all out. How he felt in that moment in his life, he just put it all out onto put it onto the celluloid for all of us to enjoy. And, uh, and I did. Thank you, Martin. I enjoyed that. He was worried about what shape he was in. He was That's 36 right. years old, smoking three packs a day. Three. Yeah, when he said three packs a day, I just thought, how does that? That is one. That's chain smoking all day, I guess. Yeah, Matt did the math on it. She, I forget what it was, but it was a cigarette every like five minutes I or something. I like the match to the math. Yeah, well, because you know it's it's a staggering amount. It's, a it's staggering like when amount. somebody tells you that a Wilt Chamberlain says I've had sex with ten thousand women. You're like, oh. I I need to know what that breaks it's, down it's, to. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. How many threesomes? How many? Why are we back on this again? Uh. <laughs> it's okay. Let, don't don't let uh, the events of last week you know prevent you from going into areas you want. If you want exactly. to talk about Wilt Chamberlain threesomes, Alex, yeah. explore that. Yeah, this seems to be the right place to do it during Hearts of Darkness. <laughs> So, yeah, I, uh, you're right. That what they said about Harvey Keitel, he was a bit too outward. They wanted um, Willard to be like more passive, a passive observer of the chaos happening around That's right. Him. That's exactly that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, passive observer. And yeah. you really feel that. I'm like, you, Harvey's not passive. He's all fucking, I'm, not, I'm, I'm observing. I'll fucking fight this observation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know who else was crazy in that movie? Dennis Hopper. Yeah. He was saying everybody actually seemed to be so fucked up on their own thing out outside of the movie. Like Dennis Hopper yeah. said he was on so many drugs that Lance the surfer said he was on speed the whole time. That's we, right. Martin yeah. Sheen was doing coke and booze, I think. The surfer even said he dropped acid. So you can imagine like acid dropping acid in the middle of a job. Your 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 acting is still a job. Uh, but he's like, he's like, no, I mean, I'm just acting like a guy who's on acid while I'm enjoying acid. What better way to enjoy acid and get paid for it at the same time? And what a trip, though, to because, you know, when you do acid or any of these hallucinogenics, you're letting go. Yeah. You're saying whatever happens here, like, I'm not ready to die, but I understand that I'm losing control a little bit. To be in the middle of a jungle in the Philippines where you've never been before and, like you said, doing your job and everything yeah. like I mean, 
that uh, a risky proposition it, it is, to let it? yourself go? Well, this is it. I mean, yeah, as it is, you know, there's enough sounds to, to get you good and paranoid without any help. Yeah. And yeah. you're not, you're filming a movie, sure, but you're in the jungles of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget the Philippines. Here's another thing that I actually wondered about because uh, I saw a really great movie during the pandemic called um, uh, First They Killed My Father. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, directed by Angelina Jolie and it's about the war in Cambodia right. around that time. But they filmed it, it came out three or four years ago. So they filmed it four or five years ago, let's say. And they were setting off fake bombs and everything, mm -hmm. just like they were in Apocalypse Now. And village elders came over and everybody was really perturbed because people had gone through this stuff. So she had to and she's very sensitive to that. And she's got children from there and everything. Sure. So she convened with all them and did some sort of ritual to like she got all their permission and then did some sort of ritual to make sure like the energy was right. I, I forget exactly hmm. what. But she made sure that uh, she was kind of adhering to their social norms. And then went ahead with filming after that. So I was just thinking the Philippines obviously have their own history. And it was going on during that. They would have to sure. borrow helicopters from the shoot to actually go fight the rebels That's in the crazy. south. So how are they getting away with all these fake explosions to people who are dealing with those uh, atrocities in that moment? I think they just kind of throw everybody a couple of bills. I think you're right. I mean, yeah. they were employing people. That's the other thing too, right? I mean, yeah. it was only a dollar a day, you know, to move 300 pound adobe blocks. But... That's still a dollar. And it so then they're like, yeah, yeah, we can deal with a few explosions. Uh, we'll tell the kids we're, we're having fun. It's uh, fireworks. Speaking of which, uh, that's another thing I forgot to mention. Uh, the next day I watched, after I watch Apocalypse Now, next day I watch this documentary, July 4th. So I enjoyed, so that was also some 5.1 surround. It was, I didn't have the firework going because I watched it earlier in the day, but it was interesting to watch Apocalypse Now on the 4th of July. I had to actually close the windows because it was so loud I couldn't really hear it. I'm not a fan of fireworks. I feel like an old curmudgeon, but I'm like, come on, shut up. Yeah, enough is enough. Everyone, grow up. And people die. An NHL yes. player got hit with a firework, 24 years old, hit in the chest, died. Are you serious? I, yeah. I didn't hear about that. Yeah. That just happened? Yeah, on this 4th. Died. Died. Took a mortar shell to the chest, a fireworks mortar shell. What the hell was he doing in the way of one? I mean, they're fireworks, man. You, Anything that's that unregulated that you're just buying at roadside, it's like true. warehouse, it's just... It's insanity. I mean, it's insanity. I, I, um, yeah, well, we also both have cats, and we're concerned about... The, the little furry children. It's true. It is, uh, it is true. They don't like it. Yeah, dogs, dogs cats. Dogs hate it. Yeah. I mean, of course, what the fuck <laughs> is going on and yeah. it's not stopping? So imagine being in the Philippines, a, a legit yeah. war zone, yeah. and you're like... A, and you're a dog, and you're like freaking out. <laughs> yeah, so <I'm> <laughs> to, it's not nice what I did. <laughs> I love it. Don't stifle that. You keep them coming. <laughs> but for real, you're not like, bang, bang, bang. Oh, they're probably filming a movie. Yeah, yeah. You're not thinking That's that. That's exactly, they're probably. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Is that Martin Sheen? <laughs> Actually, he was relatively unknown. Of at course, the time. you're totally unknown. <laughs> um, but they would have been like, "Is that a white man?" Yep, yes. Bad news. <laughs> <laughs> oh, them again. Yeah. Oh Lord. I think. Well, I don't think they said in the movie that they made a deal with the Philippine government, so they were using their helicopters. So you're right. Money definitely changed hands. That's how they were able to it's film right. there because. I actually read this amazing article from um, the New York Times from 1976 about how the U.S. military will often give a lot of money and resources to any movie about the Army or, or any, you know, the Navy, Marines, whatever, mm -hmm. um, because it is a recruitment tool. Right. This was from 1976, this article. Right. And uh, actually, John Wayne had made a movie called The Green Beret, and uh, and it was really, you know, rah-rah American, and they gave him all the money for that. I see where you're going with this, yes. Okay, well, then yeah. I won't keep going. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, <laughs> and then they actually mentioned that scene in the movie. Uh, yes. So, so um, Coppola didn't get any money from the American government because they were like, this doesn't paint us in a good light. So yeah. that's part they of the They already knew going in. Himself. Hearts of Darkness, yeah. in a second. But there's a scene when the uh, army superiors tell... Martin Sheen Willard's character that he's going to be assassinating Colonel Kurtz when they're at that table. They cut out a part, but they actually say 
they mention the Green Beret with John Wayne, and then they're like, oh, we actually funded that movie. Like, the army guys oh, say that. Right. but But they cut it out of the, the long version. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but he actually did go back to the American government when he needed more funding and said, guys, like, it's still, like, it's still an American movie, and they were like, no. We still don't buy it. They wanted him to make a couple changes, and he was like, those are going to, that's the whole movie that you're asking me to change. Oh, really? Yeah. I wonder what changes they wanted to make. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, maybe were the change where the um, where the Americans uh, do bad things, like shoot up a whole boat of innocent people. Maybe that part they wanted to change. What did, what did um, I don't know if it was Martin Sheen, or, I think it was Coppola, but he said it was, the movie was the same as the war where we were just all young, we had too much money, too much drugs, and we were bored. That's and right. And that's what a lot of the problems were in, in the movie and Vietnam. I'm talking out of my ass about Vietnam, but yes. I can imagine being 19 years old. Well, this goes to the point I was going to say earlier when you said what a drag that would have been. A drag, yes. But also, man... I would have, in 1970, or right, when, right, not right. the war, the war would have been a complete drag because I would have been terrified the whole time. But the movie? The movie, yes. I would well, have yes. I would have gone off the deep end with drugs too, I think, if I, they were that prevalent. I feel like, okay, so I feel like it depends on who we're talking about here. I'm just saying, like, first of all, like how, how long you're there and also which role you have. If you're like a guy who's already like 36 and you feel tired and all that, you know, you're not having fun like the, the young guys who are just playing guys who are on drugs anyway. Yeah. And they're just having a good old time. That, and you're the star of the movie. There's a lot yeah, more pressure. More pressure there too. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that that it, you do know you have a job to do. It's not as much fun as guys who are just like waiting for their next scene and kind of like hanging out and chilling. and Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit, I'm just saying so So there's the, those differences too. And then of course there's the crew. <laughs> Nobody thinks about the crew. It could be tough. It must be tough for the stars. It's so like, yeah. And also the guys lo- uh, hauling like whatever lights, which by the way was one of my favorite parts of the documentary. Was when he hits him in the hits face? When he hits Francis in the noggin with the light. Because I hear you look are. so apologetic you when you realize the, the look just, like, Oh, God, oh, God. But Coppola just breezed right through he it. He doesn't have time for that. It's like us knocking our heads against these fucking lights when we're, uh, when we're setting up. Yes, you'll know by the GoPro that uh, this, you knock your head and look how much space we have to work with here. It happened. Uh, did you see when they, they mentioned that the severed heads, how they were actually using cadavers? Did yes. they say that? In, they I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I think I read that as well. I think we probably caught the same thing. So they were using cadavers, and they yeah. were like, where the hell did you get these, these bodies? And yeah, they were like, oh, the guy, some Johnny guy the grave robber, he's, got, yeah. he's the one who brings them in. So they made them give those back, yeah. and then they started using extras, and they would bury them in the ground. Their heads were just poking out there, and they were there for the full filming, like in, for eight-hour eight days. Insane. They would hold, they would hold an umbrella, umbrella over them on break. Buried all, but up to Imagine their just necks. being that claustrophobic all day. You're, you're literally stuck in the dirt other in your head I couldn't do it I, I, I mean my, my, my brother sometimes would sandwich me between two mattresses this by the way I'm still shaking from it two mattresses and I couldn't move there and I would scream and I would cry and my mother uh, I would hear and they, he, she'd go Mara! which is all she did she just screamed for the other room to stop stop it and that was about all I got um, mm-hmm. no one came to my aid so I know how they feel <laughs> when I was yeah. when I was like seven years old I was playing hide and seek and I hid in a toy trunk. Yeah. And uh, when they found me, my cousins, uh, mainly my, I think it was Adam, my cousin, he was like a year younger than me. He just sat on the toy trunk instead of like saying, I found you. He sat on it and I couldn't get out. Same feeling you had being stuck between the two mattresses. Stuck with me the rest of my life. Sure. The idea of not being able to get out of Buried something. alive. Yeah. So, yeah, being buried, only my head exposed for a full day. I mean, just you have an itch. I mean, it's just so clearly they're so desperate. They'll do whatever they can just to make a buck i mean we're so god we're so rich and disgusting i was just thinking that too by the way just like how i mean art is a lovely thing but art is better when it doesn't destroy like blow up trees and like it's just so weird to kind of whenever whenever i think about you know the idea of making films seems like like great like i mean you know to have to be a filmmaker well, i'd be okay with doing that but then when i think of like the waste just to get the right shot yeah Blowing up, actually napalming stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like this is yeah. these are still like plants and like they're still living plants. Mm-hmm. Like I know that sounds a bit hippie. No, it's not hippie. It's plant. Yeah, I, I hate that you so even like, have to add that disclaimer. Yeah, they're living things. They're plants. Yeah. So you're like watching that. And you're like, I mean, 
this is, I guess, a, a, an a important story to tell, I guess. You're, but, you're so right. But if I'm a plant, I'm like, it's not that important. Yeah. I have a story, too, you know. <laughs> Nobody wants to see the story of the plant just because it's a little long. It's, it takes a while. You're absolutely right. I mean, you think, yeah, you thought the, the redo version of... Uh, Redux version of uh, Apocalypse Now is long. Talk about take a look at the plant story that goes on for just centuries. Anyway, um, it, even new. yeah, like I, I was watching um, Quentin Tarantino was on Joe Rogan's podcast, and I watched a clip of him and Rogan. I will not. I will not uh, uh, advertise that podcast here. Thank you very much. I'd like our <laughs> listeners to. I think he'll be also. fine with that. The advertising, yeah, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> He Rogan asked uh, Quentin Tarantino if people got mad at him because he had to smash so many nice cars when he made Death Proof. Sure. Like, uh, I think Chargers or Challengers, but obviously they were doing a lot of takes. And he asked him that question, and it's like, I guess it's a good question to ask because people value those cars. But you never hear that about what you just said. Like, were people mad that you destroyed, yeah. you know, the entire coastal line of yeah. the Philippines yeah. for this? I mean, I know that there was just one section and it'll grow back and all that, but it's just the idea of destruction of life you know i mean they apparently they were already going to sacrifice that water buffalo that well, was hard to watch that was like yeah that was like wow th this is a really happening like at first you look at it and you're like no that's actually a real that's not that's not that's that's not a fake animal that is a because it is sort of like almost non-reacting so you're you're first you're like wait is that no, that, no, that's real. It looked fake. It did a little At bit. At first, because yeah. it, was, it was just non react I guess it was, maybe it was like, maybe they, they first do something to it to completely de deplete it of its energy by the time. Maybe. It, or maybe that, he just couldn't even believe it. He was like, there isn't a knife in my back, is there? <laughs> <laughs> We've been you hanging out for months. You know what? I refuse to flinch at this because it's <laughs> ridiculous. Like, that could be the possibility. But we were really getting along. I like that kind of idea. <laughs> You've been feeding me. <laughs> um, your kids have some. been petting me. You know what's really funny is I watched Apocalypse Now and Hearts of Darkness on my own, but Madge was around, yeah. and uh, I was watching it, sitting here, and she came in right at that scene when they were chopping <gasps> the, That's the when buffalo. she came in. She came in, she's like, oh, no, I'm good, and she left. The next day I was watching the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> she comes in, it's a scene where they're chopping the buffalo. She's like, come on. <laughs> I don't know who to blame. <laughs> Timing, impeccable. Yeah. 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 No, the the universe needed her to see that yeah hmm. well to, yeah um it, it's weird though to like see an animal die like that because it is for sustenance you know that tribe is eating sure. it so you're like i guess i can feel okay about this but boy that sure is murder yeah <laughs> you sure are chopping the shit out of yeah. that living creature yeah that's the thing is that i think it's like when you look at like uh, when something's being slaughtered by by like one cut or something like that it's pretty nasty looking but it also you know it's just that's all we're doing mm -hmm. when you see something hacked you're like well do we need to hack now i'm bringing it back to faroe islands again that just happened you said the, the link that's right the grind again yeah. so we're bringing it back to to other sea spheres yeah so like yeah, it's, it's it's the same kind of thing where you're where you're like uh, i'm like is it, is it it seems a bit like extra brutal is that necessary i don't know but I, it's not that brutal because it was dead pretty quick uh, I guess it must have been, yeah. It looked like it went down. I don't know quick. where they made the first, the initial incisions, so I'm not sure. Yeah, you want to talk about the ending? Coppola had a uh, a dream about the end. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, he had. Uh, there was. <laughs> I love it because it was so. I loved hearing it from the point of view of like anyone who is has an idea in their dream and they wake up and they go to write it down, right? Do like you ever do that? Because I, if I don't write it down, I'm like, I'm mad at myself. I'm, I'm like, how many sure. ideas do I have? One, two, a year, maybe? Well, <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> wow, you, it takes you a long time to build your act. Uh, for him, What act? For him, he, he probably woke up. He's like, that's it. That's it. I have the ending. And then he started writing it down. And this is the part I like. It was shit. The ending was garbage. It was like he was like, oh, I can't use that, which I know that feeling, too. Is he, that the ending where it was supposed to be the battle with the Viet Cong? I think that was. I think that was the the. I think it was an ending. That ending was the ending in the original script. That uh, you know, what's the fellow's name? Um, he, Milius. Yeah, that's it. He wrote, he, that he wrote. I think it was. And 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 Coppola found it to comic book. Um, and then um, and then he. But I think he was searching for an ending. And that's the thing is, he woke up, thought he had something. He didn't say what it was, but he was just like it was garbage. That yeah. was when he uses the term idiot. Uh, 
Idiocy. Idiocy is because he was like, this is just garbage. When they said the ending was going to originally have that battle with the Viet Cong, and then he said that's actually a step down from the movie, like it doesn't build on anything. I was like, I guess I agree, but damn, I would have loved to see a battle. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's that's what separates him from you. Yeah. But no, I I enjoy that because often when I see big battle scenes, I'm like, uh, I I do check out. So I appreciate that he did it. But a part of me is also like, what would that battle have looked yeah. like? Wouldn't it hurt to have a little dream where they had a, like, Willard has a battle scene in his head, and then he wakes up and goes, oh, that's not what it was at all. And that way you still get your battle, but now we still have a different ending. Because everybody loves a waking up from a dream out of a battle ending, or close to ending. The point is... Uh, what is the point? That uh, I liked also the moment where Francis thought... Uh, uh, he had enough. He couldn't. He just didn't think this was going to work out. I love the, all those all the yelling about. Uh, but she's like, you guys thought it was an A paper. You turn in a B. It's not a B. It's an F. And they started yeah. with that. It's an F. And then and then there's the uh, fact that um, he said he was so desperate. He said uh, he said uh, if I just move just a few inches. On, he was up on the uh, scaffold or something like that, if I, or it was a cliff. I don't remember what it was, but he was like, if I just move a few inches that way, you know, that'd be a thirty foot fall. I mean, I might die, but. I might just get paralyzed, <laughs> yeah. and that'd be a graceful way to go out. <laughs> you know what we haven't graceful. talked about yet? His wife, Eleanor, I believe her name was. Eleanor? Uh, yes, that's right, Eleanor. She was so supportive. She's a great, she, she, was was a, a, she was a model, uh, uh, just not just you know wife, but like just partner in general. Like bringing the whole family over there, two young boys. This and it. even the way she said, like she was like, so what? If this movie flops, yeah, you put all your money into it, but we entertain too much. We have this big house, so what? We got to downsize? Who cares? It was too much for her that anyway. That takes a lot of the pressure it off. takes the pressure off. She's saying, like, you know, you follow your heart. He totally thinks she's a brave guy, and he'll figure it out, and he's fine. And She trusted that he's an artist he would say he's things she was like he's an artist i the know risk. he's got to go crazy totally exactly yeah. so under so great that he she understood him so well to have that in your corner the fact that she was also like brave because she was like she made it was like fun to take these risks yeah i mean not everybody thinks risks are fun yeah. usually they think they say things like what the hell are you doing you're risking us you're risking the family yeah. there's a lot of that especially when you're already famous like coppola it's like you don't have to put your own money up the, isn't the number one rule don't put your own money yeah, up? i know i know so but, yeah but he wanted she to go great. all in he wanted to go all in it was yeah. also the fact that he wanted zoe trope films to be like the, it's his first production but but yeah she was uh she was uh Good, an, a model of partner. Yeah, she really for an had, artist, for an artist who just wants to like do whatever they want to do. That's the thing. Yeah, it's like uh, to bring it back to another one, the Delorean one, where he just said to his wife, he was like, yeah, "We'll figure it out." Like she was, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. But the Eleanor and, and uh, Francis Coppola seemed a lot more like they were totally. they were doing things in tandem. Yes, that's the <laughs> difference between uh, modeling, uh, modeling, marrying a model uh, wife. Because you know you, you think she's hot, and marrying someone who is your artistic equal. Mm-hmm. Well, you used the term equal. model partner earlier. Yes. The difference between marrying a model uh-huh. as your wife and the and having a wife, a model wife. Anyway, <laughs> a model, <laughs> model <laughs> partner and a partner who's a model. I think that's <laughs> what you, you meant go. to do. Boom. That's, that's okay. right. <laughs> Workshopping it on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> so so happy to help you in these moments. I, you ever feel a thought leave you halfway through? You're like. Dear Lord, somebody's listening to me and they expect me to see this through to the end. I know, and we're all waiting, we're all looking. Come on, what did you got? That's how Francis felt about the end. Mm, mm. Bringing it all back. Yep. Speaking of the end, I love how he didn't have an end and him and Brando were just writing frantically and they showed that scene where Brando's like, just in his dramatic, like the shadow on him and he's like just saying lines and he says something and then off camera, Coppola's coaxing him and he's like, why? And he's like, because... We must. I'm not going to do a good Brando, obviously. Sure. He's like, because we must. Oh, because we are the ones who shall rule the earth. And then off camera, Coppola's like, now walk for me. And like Brando gets up and starts walking. And then he tells him, to, he's like, say something else. And he's like, uh, for we're the ones who have been promised this. Whatever the dialogue is. And then he's still walking. And he's eating his peach or apple or whatever. And then he just stops and still in character. He's like, I can't think of any more dialogue. <laughs> no. <laughs> He was but still done. as Colonel Kurtz. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He, Colonel Kurtz was done for the day. <laughs> yeah. Not Brando. Yeah. Brando's still p- collecting that check. Three million. Yeah, But here's my thing. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah. I mean, he's helping. Well, that was the whole thing, right? There were It was tied up with, with uh, investors. 
I mean, he's that's what he's worth. He got those investors. You can finish your film because of my name. I mean, you know, of course, some people uh, felt like he was uh, phoning it in near the end. What? Just because he had ear, he had <laughs> he had like uh, cue cards on people some of the time and all that sort of thing. Did he? Yeah, like in Godfather, there's a picture of that. A lot of actors don't know their lines. Like Robert Downey Jr. said they have earpieces now. I heard right. in an interview with him. It's a lot of lines, man. Yeah. I mean, even you look at Brando, you're like, oh, he came in at the end. He doesn't have that many lines. He has a lot of lines. He's still got a... I'm not saying he couldn't have memorized it, but it still worked yes. for $3 million. <laughs> it's, it's the thing. It's a, it is a lot of lines. And if nobody can tell the difference if you're getting it in your ear or if you memorize them, and you're collecting the check and you no longer care about the work. Oh, there was, a, there was a, <laughs> there's actually a thing on like, uh, you could see on YouTube with like, uh, Christopher Reeve was actually taking him to task on Letterman. Letterman really? was asking about working with mom. Yeah, yeah, he was sort of disappointed in the guy. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you can look that up. Yeah, Dennis Hopper said they did not get along. He said, I'll do your movie, Francis, but I want to have one line with Marlon Brando. Yeah. That's all. And Marlon Brando was like, I don't want to do a line with this guy. And then they got into an altercation because um, Brando f didn't read Heart of Darkness, yeah. the novella that yeah. that this movie is loosely based on, of course. And um, Francis Ford Coppola was pretty upset about that. But then at dinner one night, Dennis Hopper had a Green Beret book, like a little red book that only Green Berets are supposed to have, and he had it in his pocket. So he looked over at Marlon Brando and said, you don't even, uh, you haven't even read the book, have you? But he was talking about his Green Beret book, but before he could pull it out, Marlon Brando thought he was jumping on him about not reading Heart of Darkness. He was like, I don't have to put up with this, and like <laughs> so stormed shit. away. <laughs> He's so shit. <laughs> That's so funny. It's so funny. Uh, and he was right. Marlon Brando did, uh, was pissed off at the wrong thing. He was right to be pissed off, but just at the wrong thing. Yeah. And, and also that he, um, he, he, uh, he also didn't read Heart of Darkness. He had one job for like three million. He was like, could you do me a favor? Just read the novella Heart of, Heart of Darkness, if you could just read that. And, uh, and he was like, uh, yeah, I'll see if I have time. He was like, kind of like a, you know, trying to pencil into my schedule I think that that's also that's a much better Marlon Brando but I, I want to say in his defense I read an article where they said that was bullshit the way they portrayed him he did read Heart of Darkness oh really he had hundreds of pages well, of why notes why do that I don't know I, I forget yeah the but other. that also sounds like someone would say if he just feels like saying anything he wants to say but there were a couple weeks where hundreds him hundreds of pages of notes yeah him and Francis Ford Coppola were walking around trying to come up with the ending for like two weeks he was actually helping him he was very involved in the sure. process so why do you think and that, he, why do you here's think an they, actor why would they is it like because uh, Coppola wants to take more of the credit for all that he doesn't want anybody else to get the credit for he came up with it all on his own kind of thing I don't know but it's clear that that ending was when you watch I like the ending and I love the movie but when mm -hmm. you watch the documentary and then you think back on the ending you're like yeah I can tell you just kind of tried to figure out how this thing should end you yeah, know, I mean, I guess like that. that's it how does, all endings it does, happen. It does feel like that. No, but it is. I mean, you know, I was watching it, you know, with my wife, and she also felt like the end was kind of like, oh, what was that? And and so I think that it did have the feeling of, of um, just an ending. I mean, he killed the guy. Yeah, but then I did like the way when he leaves, all the villagers. Yeah kind of it's almost like he's new the new king yeah they were under Which, the old guy's spell but they were happy that he's gone now kind of yeah it's yeah the, the king is dead long live the king kind of thing and yeah but um yeah i guess i mean it's okay it's, i just think that it's 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 not i don't think the ending is what people think like wow that's what really made the film so i don't i think the fact that i think some someone had criticism for the process of it. it's like oh yeah you know it's i mean to think about it when it goes i'm trying to remember who said this you know think about it as it goes along uh, to kind of figure it out as it goes along in making a film i mean you'll probably get like a long film with not really a lot of narrative structure mm -hmm. um you know kind of go on and that's sort of it felt like that it felt like something oh yeah I could see this kind of him figuring it out as it goes a bit he had a few key scenes totally that was there but there's an element of like figuring it out and the end and to not know the ending yet 
But that's also why I loved the movie because it was so free flowing. Like that's it. you did yeah, exactly. feel like you that's were just made it work. Exactly. Yeah. And that was also and that's also the chaos of being in war. That's part of what made it feel like you it also made you feel tense because you really didn't know what to expect next and where you're where you're heading next. Mm-hmm. Um actually I think that's part of the reason I like the going to the uh, the French colonizers is because uh, they were out of the forest. It was like something, it really made it even more like, oh, we're now in, in this dining room. You know? Yeah, I don't know if I would have liked that or if I liked the fact that I felt like I was in the jungle kind the entire time. trapped in the time. jungle, yeah. yeah. It did make, yeah, it made it a, a kind of somewhat a, of a different movie for sure. Mm. So, um, uh, but... Uh, I will say as a movie, yeah, I'd take The Godfather over Apocalypse Now. Yeah, yeah. You would too? Well, that's because narratives are more sad, satisfying than like kind of just psychedelic journeys right i mean a psychedelic journey is more fun when you're actually feeling the drug too um Mm -hmm. to watch a psychedelic journey is not as uh satisfying as um a plot structure and yeah yeah something you can kind of you feel like there's there's the arc and there's the resolution and the resolution works yeah you ready yeah, the, the wrap up, the new wrap up segment. Sure. Uh, when you say, "Am I ready? Am I prepared?" No. Am I ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. So there's the three questions we have. They are: What did you learn? How did you feel? And where do we go from here? Here we go. Alex, what did you learn? Um, I learned that uh, you have to be a very courageous person uh, to be a filmmaker. Sometimes, like I would think, like part of me, is, part of me thinks, like, hmm, would I want to write or direct? And the part of me that likes to get up, have a nice coffee, relax on the couch for a second, you know, start writing. He wants to be a writer, but uh, but it's pretty thrilling to be a director if you got to fly by the seat of your pants. I mean, um, yeah, I learned that uh, I'm not sure, so sure that that would be the kind of directing that I could do. Yeah, well, like I said, he was already a huge star, so he so, could have rested on his laurels. Kind of, yeah. That was I really respected him. No, he's a brave, he's a brave and strong-willed man. He has yeah. a lot of energy. That's a thing. I don't mm-hmm. know, have that kind of energy. Yeah, the cocaine helped. Oh, right. There's that. <laughs> I learned that it would have been terrible to be a Playboy playmate going on those USO tours. Yeah. Like the the girls having to come out and dance, like just a bunch of horny young guys yeah, with guns terrifying. and drugs. I hate to break it to you though. I looked I looked it up. I, re- I watched. I read a Playboy interview. Those that that was that never actually happened. Like that scenario Playboy, would not, never no, have happened. No, that that never happened. They made that up. Well, like Playboy bunnies never went over there. You mean not like that? No. But they went over during World War. They didn't. They wouldn't have gone during World War Two because Playboy wasn't around. No, it wasn't around. So yeah, that didn't that didn't happen. Did they, they said go- one time apparently if you bought, what was it? You paid a certain amount f- and bought someone a, a lifelong subscription, then a Playboy bunny would come to to deliver it. And so oh, they, they got, still do so that. They got They're one, so nice, right? So they got one to come all the way over there to deliver it to a, a soldier. They kind of everybody, all the soldiers pitched in and bought one guy. Really? And, yeah. So that's the closest they came to going to Vietnam. I just thought you should know that. Well, you didn't burst my bubble. Now I'm happy that no Playboy bunnies had to go through that. Or only one, I guess. See? And yeah. you did also truly learn something there. I did, yeah. The I thought minute. I learned something, but you were like, the thing you thought you learned, <laughs> that's not what you learned. Let me teach you something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex, how'd you feel? Uh, how'd I feel? I felt um, I felt like I, like I was, you know, I was kind of impressed with how movies still have that emotional impact where I did feel the tension and the... Uh, and a little bit of the horror of like watching uh, a- acts of war, and and then that's from the movie, and then I and then from the um, from watching the the doc, I felt uh, kind of tired for them, <laughs> mm-hmm. kind of just it's like ah oh God, it just keeps going and going and going and and feeling the anguish of like not being to able to achieve this great thing that you want to achieve to feel that it's funny you've, the movie was about feeling the anguish you don't really feel the victory at the end no it's you're just right. a quick all they show you is like oh here's like a premiere all right that's it you don't even really get they don't even show you like oh here all here's all the the critical praise that he got no it's true it was just the here's this is why it's, it was a heart of darkness it was tough yeah 
Yeah, and while you're making it, you don't know it's going to go on to that acclaim. You're like, I hope so, but I could just be deep in the jungle of Philippines for a bust. Yeah. You assume with you know the star power involved, it's not going to be a bust, but you don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You never know. Star power doesn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, it can, but it's not a guarantee. Like a, Even back then, there were like five big stars, Marlon Brando sure. being one of them. So yes. you got him attached. Yeah, but I mean, it could still... Uh, you know, it could still not be a good film. Yeah, true. <laughs> that uh, was his worry. Yeah. I I felt uh, like uh, internal chaos the whole time. That's the movie. Mm. I felt that the acid kind of rock and roll war movie that he wanted to make, I felt that. I think he really succeeded in that. During the documentary, I felt... Um, I felt like I respected the the audacity of his vision. I felt like a, a huge amount of respect for Francis Ford Coppola. Even when they showed him like yelling on mm. the set, which wasn't that common, but it mm. happened. I was like, I get it. Sure. I get pretty. I was on the phone with United Airlines for an hour and forty minutes today. I, you know, I melted down harder than any footage of Francis Ford Coppola. Wow. That's Not at them, but once I got off. Sure. Yeah. That's, so, uh, yeah. but yeah, th to have that many a six hundred person crew, yeah. that yeah. many moving parts, you're dealing with the Pentagon trying mm -hmm. to get funding from them, the Philippine Army, mm -hmm. who are literally taking their helicopters away from you at some point to actually go fight a real battle. Like th There's a, a lot, lot of pressure, and th I mean, I mean, and you, like you say, you lost it, and the budget wasn't nearly as high when you when you're flying economy. No, and it ended up being only eight dollars because I was using credit from. Uh, it wasn't the time. Wow. Or it wasn't the money. It was the time, Alex. Oh, uh, that's what it is. It was the loss of time. That's right. Mm -hmm. They took yeah. my time away. From <laughs> I got what I got. What you're saying. You thought it was going to be a five minute call. Now you're in the jungle for an hour and fifteen minutes. That's right. But you know what? I didn't even think it would be a five minute call. They didn't surprise me at all. I knew what I was getting into, and I knew there was no way to avoid it. Huh. Their sight was down, and I said, I have to wade into this goddamn jungle. <laughs> and that's where you grit your teeth. <laughs> yeah, you dug your heels in on that one. Martin Sheen style, let's do this. <laughs> and then I just checked out. I was just a passive observer listening wow. to the hold music for an hour and yeah. a half. Yeah, on coke. <laughs> what a weird choice. <laughs> um, Final question. Where do we go from here? Uh, where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I was thinking that when he, with the last line from, from the doc where he was talking about, it was the last line or something like that from him when he was talking it about. It is the very last line of is, the doc. Is it? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I do. It was yeah, very the, powerful. Yeah. Where he's talking about how, you know, when, when it becomes, the budgets become uh, much smaller to be able to make a film wherever with an eight millimeter or something like that, or like some. Some kid with her uh, dad's uh, camcorder, the the uh, eight year old fat girl from uh, what was it like uh, Ohio? Eight year old fat girl from Ohio. Ohio. He said, "Yeah." <laughs> I was like, "Why do you have to throw in uh, fat? fat?" Fat girl. I think it's. I think it. I think he understands. That you have nothing else to do but to make movies when you're not like uh, when you're not being invited to the dances or whatever bullshit yeah. that you have to handle as a teenager. Seemed like That's eight year old. That's no, fat. <laughs> Wait a second, eight year old. Yeah, he had to throw in fat. Maybe he was fat when he was a kid. Well, he was fat as an adult, although he lost 35 pounds filming the movie. Oh. Yeah, because of coke and, That's I mean, right. maybe sicknesses. Also, they're there during typhoons and yeah. stuff. The commitment. Where do we go from here for me? I First of all, this movie uh, made me laugh so many times because Tropic Thunder is one of my favorite movies mm -hmm. and just made me realize how pitch perfect Tropic Thunder's portrayal was of making a war movie. Right. Like there's literally Danny McBride's character in Tropic Thunder is the guy who's like got to blow up the tree line and right. stuff. There's literally right. people who are just their job is to like, I'm going to blow up all these right. trees here. Right. And the idea of that person loving their job as much as Danny McBride does in right. the movie. Or even Ben Stiller being so self-serious. I, I just, I love their portrayal of uh, a pretentious war movie kind of right. gone wrong. Right. But uh, where do we go from here? I'd love to see, maybe they exist, but um, an audacious war movie. Like, uh, do you know what? I wouldn't even say war movie because there are a lot of war movies. I like the audacity Okay, I'm going to add a disclaimer. Because I was going to say, I like the audacity of saying, okay, guys, we're here for eight months. We're all making this movie. But I don't even know if you could do that anymore. I don't think you could get an actor or their agent to agree to just like, you know? Like, I don't care how big the director is. I don't think David Fincher could be like, listen, guys, we're going to the middle of Asia, and I don't know how long it's going to be, but it could be eight months. I don't think that movie's getting made anymore. So I don't know I, where we go from here. I don't think that the movie, I don't think that, 
I don't think the movie is going to get made if you start off by saying eight months. But if you start with three and you work your way up to eight, mm. that's how you do it. You hook them in. Once they're there, they have to keep going. But I do think that um, uh, that's irrelevant because it's going to be that eight-year-old fat girl who's going to make the next big movie. I want to bring it back to my thing because I realized all we were talking about was fat. Yeah, she's a fat girl. She's a fat girl. I'm like, I'm like, no, but my point is, is that, is that um, it's kind of funny that he pre- he was like I was about to get into the whole like you know oh wow he was pre he was pre prescient about YouTube no 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 but the girl's fat I'm like can I finish my point <laughs> See, no no no, no. Tropic Thunder is a good movie that's a movie I'm like wait a second I had a point to make about YouTube <laughs> go ahead yeah go ahead. anyway he thought he he foresaw YouTube and and I'm sure there are a lot of eight year olds on YouTube that <laughs> anybody type anybody type and of any body type thank that's you. Right. And and uh, and and now we have iPhones. We can make we can make a and their pod video. The other video podcast. Anyway, yeah. YouTube. What I've now I lost my point. No, you got it. Okay. You made your point, and he made so that point in like 1990. Very prescient point. That's, that's right. That's the point you're trying to make. Yeah, and I he, know. No, I he like knew the, where we go from here. I liked mine better because I looked like it was degenerating, just the same way like it looked like the film was degenerating. Mm. Mm. Mine was like I was living. I was I was Vietnam at that moment. <laughs> I got you. I would like to say that I like the vulnerability of things I read about Marlon Brando being self-conscious about being fat and only wanting to be That's filmed true. in the shadow. That's true. That brings a really human edge to a, a human side to a global icon. You know what I mean? He's That's not true. just, he's a, he's a person, damn it. Yeah. He, he felt self-conscious. He did, yeah. Was, he didn't want to wear like a tight suit and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Good for, for him be, being a human. For real, though. Yeah. And he was one of the first, like, real movie stars, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a lot to take on. Mm, it's true. Are we going to fizzle this podcast at the end like this? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we kind of, we had a crescendo, and then it was like, let's, let's just look around longingly <laughs> while a psychedelic song plays on. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. That's good. You could, you could, maybe if you could add. Let me try a helicopter sound effect, because you did it really well. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, Jeez, I suck at sound effects. Oh, <laughs> Lord in heaven. <laughs> but I think, by the way, I did have something left over from Marlon Brando being self conscious. It's certainly when he said, like, fat. Because he, when he was told that he was, like, overweight, he was like, it was like, uh, overweight. I can't even do Brando. Forget it. Forget it. Cut that whole thing. <laughs> Cut the whole thing. Next Let's go week. back to. The there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you could, if you could, if you could add sitar to our existing music, that would be great. Oh my God, I have to end this podcast. I'm not doing another episode with you. I have to devote all my time and attention to this great idea I just thought of. Terrible ASMR, just me oh. making. And now here's a cat licking a saucer of milk. <laughs> so you're like, doing that, it? That sounds more like a helicopter than the other one did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week we're watching the one and only Dick Gregory. I'm pumped for that. It's called the one and only Dick Gregory. That's right. You, he wasn't saying we're like it's like it's we're watching Dick Gregory. The one and <laughs> only. That's the name of the the documentary. The one and only Dick Gregory. Yes. I don't know much about him. Obviously, yeah, the, him I, being a legend in yeah. the comedy game. Uh, but it's uh, apparently it's our game. So this will be the first time that we're we've chosen a subject that is closer to our endeavors. That's right. Mm. Well, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Thanks. I'm DJ. I'm Alex, and let's uh, get out of here.